Hey, Bob, it's great to see you again. I, I'm really super psyched about the opportunity of spending another week at amazing Menla in September. Oh, we're really looking forward to it when you come. Yeah, it's it's, it's always it's really, absolutely one of the highlights of my year. And, and the material, I mean, this non-duality nature of mind gig is it's like my favorite program because we get we get right down to it. We get to the essence right, of it. And yeah. so, I thought we, I thought what we could do is is chat a little bit about some of the stuff we're planning on discussing to okay. give folks a, a sense of 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 the scope, the depth, the profundity of what we're going to be dealing with. And so I'm, I'm just going to ping a couple of questions your way. And one of them is, you know, everybody's so busy this day in, in, in this modern age. Why why should anyone be interested in things like non-duality and, and nature of mind, right? I mean, I, it's so busy. Well, yeah, well, because it's reality. And a human being needs to know that a green light means you can go across without getting run over. And a red light means you can. So every, we always need to know reality. So if reality is non-duality, and especially because it's the non-duality of nirvana and samsara, or of whatever people, or God and life, you know, or, uh, you know, liberation, you know, nirvikampa samadhi and engagement in differentiated compassionate activities. So the, so the, the non-duality brings the good thing into immediacy. And that's really, that's lucky that reality is like that. That is lucky. And so do you think, is it fair to say, uh, you know, these are such tricky terms to define like enlightenment. Is it fair to say that one definition of attaining enlightenment is realizing non-duality? Yeah, sure. You could definitely say that. But when it is that non-duality, I mean, you could have a non-duality of, you know, the filing cabinet and the wall. You know, that wouldn't matter, that wouldn't matter much. Right. But it's if it's not reality of nirvana, of of the blissful nature of reality itself, is embedded here in this in seemingly insufficient and inadequate reality that we're suffering, and we're struggling with, and we're frustrated by, and that actually, if we knew its reality, we would be not frustrated by it. We would be engaging with it in a positive way because we would realize we're already at the goal state. So that so it's a really great thing. and therefore if nirvana is defined, I mean if enlightenment is defined as totally knowing reality and therefore totally caring about everybody else and everything else, then uh, that's a definitely desirable thing to be engaged with. What do you think? I think yeah, this is such an important point because one of the really highlight insights for me over the last number of years is is understanding finally that in this regard the path altogether is is more perceptual than actual right i mean you're really not going anywhere in fact when you think about a path on one level that actually sets you out and away from that which you really seek right so i think it's really important to to share that at least my understanding of it is um, we're going nowhere or now here per right. the path is perceptual not actual well, but then we don't want to, we don't, do we really want to make a, a difference between perceptual and actual? I think we want, sometimes that means that your perception is deceiving, you know. No, um, but what I'm getting at, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is, it is when you don't know non-duality, but mm -hmm. when, you, when you experience non-duality in whatever way you do, which is very controversial as far as that, how, what it actually perceives it, <laughs> since you are it. But anyway, um, uh, I think we want to call that your actual and your perceptual are the same at that time. I think we want. To okay, I guess what I was trying to point out is is um, I think that sometimes when we we talk, for instance, like spiritual path, sometimes the very notion of path itself can actually lead us astray. It's like what is it? What is the saying? It's like um, you cannot find it by seeking, but only seekers will find it. Right? Something like that. Kind of. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's the difference between the the cause vehicle and the fruition vehicle, right? They're both vehicles in the sense that you're still making changes, but the fruition one, you're you're operating on the view that you're already there, and you're removing obstacles to, to experiencing that. And the other one, you're not there and you're going there. So those those are two different ones. And the 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 the, the non duality one wants to move to the fruitional one very strongly has a strong push to move to it the danger of it of course is that some person who's a complete materialist and they then they'll think well non duality means this is nirvana so what the hell you know I'll just get what I can out of it you know they can make a <laughs> they can make it doesn't matter out of it you know 
Yeah. But it happens doesn't matter. So then they won't have the caring side, you know, and that that's a danger of the of pushing someone past the, the cause vehicle level to when they're not ready for it. You know? Right. And so the point that I'm hearing from you then, Bob, is, is we really need both. We we yes. need the causal vehicle and then we transcend but include it as, yes. as we mature. Well, the... Some of us do, some of us don't. Maybe I don't know. Maybe you did. <laughs> You never know. Some people don't, or or put it that way. For Buddhists would always say, somebody, some people did the causal vehicle enough in a previous life to have a spontaneous, quick uh, insight in the in the in the fruitional vehicle. You know, and um, uh, you could, you know, you can certainly say that. You know, the other point around this, I think, is important, at least in my path, is that on one level it seems like non-duality slash enlightenment is like we're talking about here. It's like, oh my gosh, it's so immediate. It's here, it's right in front of me. Yes. But but then on another level, it seems like it's like light years away, right? Oh, maybe someday yeah. if I'm really lucky in a future life, yeah. I'm gonna stumble into this. So maybe say a little bit, say a little bit more about that, the, the balancing between the immediacy of it and, and the seeming yeah. distance of it. Well, that's the thing. In other words, given the immediacy, then you get into the issue. I think this maybe this highlights why why it's very important in Buddhist tantra to have the bodhisattva vow, mm. because the bodhisattva vow before you experience the immediacy, the bodhisattva vow makes you want to seek it very intensely. So it makes you tolerate the immediacy that you don't know, but you act as if you as if it was immediate. So in other words, it's like you fake it until you make it Right. sort of routine. Um, and that what makes you want to do that, I think, is, is the Bodhisattva vow is building on your familial and natural humanoid compassion, sensitivity to others and ability to empathize with them, building on that and wanting to make that make them happy really quickly. So uh, then grasping the immediacy urges that come non-dogmatically, of course, mm. from from the tradition, uh, you that makes you feel you can get you can do it faster. And then you mentioned mind, and I, I always am uncomfortable with the nature of mind as being the be all and end all because I'm I'm afraid uh -huh. it's going to lead to some vijnana bada. Uh huh. Mind only. School. Right. And uh, and uh, I, I have this uh, more linguistic feeling that mind and matter are a dualism, and they don't really mean that neither word means much without the other, without being the opposite of the other. And so when you get into only mind, it's like the modern materialists, they're an only matter, and then they're stuck. Right. They're completely right. stuck. They can't. Well, isn't is, is it an interesting? It, 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 to me, that that trap speaks to the, to the blind spots of, of both so-called Eastern and Western, that on one level... Yeah. A big blind spot is reductionism into matter, and then uh, somewhat Eastern and globaliz globalization breaks down these boundaries. But reductionism, from an Eastern perspective, would be in fact reducing everything to mind, right? In this exactly. sense, exactly. Yes, yeah. and I tried to get one time uh, uh, poor Deepak Chopra, who I like a lot. Oh yeah, he's great. Oh, he got himself in bad trouble with a guy, some scientist that he was dialoguing. He even helped the scientist write a book. And then the scientists started denouncing him because he was forced to by the, um, you know, oh, the, yeah. the quadruplex genius, you know, the great mathematician, did black holes, I have a name issue, you know. You so, know. Uh, Stephen Hawking's probably, yeah. yeah. So the Hawking people gave him the opportunity, the scientists, to, to edit some papers of Hawking's and make some great dialogue with Hawking himself, you know. And so he was denouncing Deepak as a zealot you know, a mind-only zealot, you know, let's all mind, you know, Brahma mind, you know, like a Hindu Vedanta version kind of zealot. And um, so I urged Jimmy Deepak to not overdo that it's only mind, you know. Right, yeah. Then he can't be a zealot, then he's just a, he's a scientist too. Right, he's right. Looking at the mind as a scientist does. And not not having a dogma that it isn't it doesn't exist, which is their problem, you know. Yeah, it's inter inter to me interesting that extremism, fundamentalism, works on a lot of different levels. I mean, on one level, that's a fundamentalist extremist point of view, whether it's materialist or idealist, yeah. right? On one level, yeah. there you're you're swinging the pendulum one way or the other too far, exactly. right? Which is why I love Buddha's hermeneutic principle, that you know where he said when he was enlightened. Remember that thing where he said, "Well, I'm not going to." No matter what I say, they won't get it from what I say. And then he says, and then the other one is where he says, 
anything I say, you have to measure it and think it through and critique it and do the devil's advocate against it. And then if it works out, then accept it, but don't accept it because I said it. So yeah. in other words, it's like the modern scientific methodology. Experience trumps. I hate to right. use the word. Yeah, it's a dangerous word. <laughs> Experience overwhelms uh, dogma. Yeah. Theory. Theory can never capture the inconceivability of non-dual, fabulous, wonderful and reality. Well, this is perfect because one of the things we'll be doing at Mullet together is working through the classic Indic pedagogical approach of the three wisdom tools, where it's super interesting and, and or to me, super common in this information age, we really do get stuck with TMI, too much information. Yes. And so in, in order in order to transfer, you know, we confuse information for experience. And so to really actualize this, to discover it, to experience it, what we're going to be working with together are the, the transformative methods, the meditations. Absolutely. That's the key, because otherwise it's just sophistry and philosophy, and that's not going to really change right. you. You're right. changing when you're... That's right, that's right. It's, 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 really, it's really elusive. It drives one to poetry. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. So... So that's great. So, uh, so um, I'm really looking forward to it, Andrew. Really. And oh. What about the body? What do you, you have a question here about the body? Yeah, yeah. What is the role of the body in all this? Because, on one level, if we, especially you're I'm working with this um, sometimes unconscious assumption that spiritual is not merely set in contradistinction to physical and material but in opposition to it right what then is the relationship of the spiritual to to the physical material and and the role of the body in all this right right well i think you you are the arch expert on all this which i love in the sense that you know and over the years working with you it's become more and more clear to me that the the way to move toward the subtle body, the way mm. to move, the way to move toward the coarse body, and uh, once you're free from just only worrying about it, you know, by seeing it, you know, by accepting its nature, you know, uh, its normal, its nature, if if untethered to a higher perspective, and that is your work with the lucid dreaming. Yeah, and then that lucid dreaming leads to the bardo, the between state. And then the between state, from the between state come the, come the different stages of the subtle yogas. So that we, in other words, they are stages that everybody goes through every time they die and then are reborn. And even sometimes when they faint or when they go into altered states and then, are, and then come back from them, which is like a death and rebirth sort of experience that people can have. And <clears throat> so... It's like the Tantra just didn't make up, okay, now you do this and you envision that and the other thing happens, et cetera. It's actually the processes of going down toward the really subtle level yeah. of mind and body. Yeah. Right? The body, because you have a body in a dream. You don't pay attention to it, a non-lucid dreamer, because you're just a point of awareness. But if you lucidly dream, you become aware that you are having a body there, which isn't your usual body. Right. It's a body. Right. It's a subtle body, right? And then... You learn, oh, well, maybe I can work with that. And uh, you can develop, how do you develop the subtle body? And that moves you into realizing the range of mind and its physical correlates. Yes. They're not just the coarse body of flesh and blood. Yeah, that's spot but on. And I. It's just mind, though, that includes body. It's like, absolutely. It's like the subtle body is still body. You know, that's what that's. And that, and that you know, the, I always think of uh, Thomas Nagel. Mm. said that the biologists are scared to look at mind in a scientific way uh -huh. because they think if the they, since they think the mind is some kind of superstition from old religions and souls and things like that that then god will come back and you know they'll all get burned at the stake for cloning a sheep or something <laughs> and that's a real danger actually because of crazy fundamentalist uh, religious people it's true but on the other hand, the, the Tibetan science, Indian, and then eventually refined by Tibetan science and kept alive by Tibetans, that science about the subtle body and about how to move and how to find your subtle body with your coarse body and explore it and the teachings of how to do that and the methods of how to do that, that is unique to them and it is scientific. It's not, it's like a, a discipline, like a, 
you know, like an athlete who has the science behind doing some yoga and not, not to get worn out in the fifth set in the first, right, first right, set. and no spoiler there, no spoiler, right, and and uh, the other one doesn't bother, and then, then maybe they get a cramp in their muscle or something, you know. Yeah, like yeah. In science, that's yoga is not just superstitions; it's science about the way the body works. And then the subtle mind and bo subtle body, the nervous system, I call that our own Buddhist inner in Buddhist uh, neuroscience. That's totally, it. totally. And you are so great in teaching about that. Your books on the well, thank teaching, you. Your books on the bardo are, are truly, truly good. That's I very kind of you, Bob. But you know, one of the things that also these pieces. What we'll be covering in Mela together, in addition to these very specific targeted topics of non-duality, nature, mind, we start to realize, just like you're saying here, how much is involved with this? We're also correlative benefits of working with subtle body, working wow. with lucid sleep, lucid dream, working with yoga. And then I really want to put an exclamation point, like like Sarah has, Sarah has said, you know, the great um, Siddha, wisdom yeah. abides in the body. And so really, to me, I'm curious how this lands with you. It's just as much about waking down and in as it is about waking up yeah, and realizing that, that we have these wisdom bodies within us. Yes, yes. I don't, I'm not so crazy about, I mean, awakening is part of enlightenment, but there's a, there's a movement among younger translators not to use the word wisdom and substitute insight for prajna mm. and to only say awakening for enlightenment rather than enlightenment for enlightenment or both, you know, with both components. And I say they're not respecting the Tibetans and the Indian pundits who have Buddha is glossed as Vibuddha and Prabuddha. And Prabuddha can be awakening, it's like blossoming. And Vibuddha means enlightening by knowing everything. You know, it's omniscience, you know. And then I, I, I thought when you said about information, the, the differentiating between information and experience, I thought that's quite amazing. And again, that could be a definition of enlightenment. An enlightenment where you don't have to know the information because you are all the information. So then they yeah. have that saying about you know by not knowing. So in other words, when meaning not knowing dualistically, where you have an object that you then have a term for and you think you control by being able to label it and pick it out. When you are all of the information, you sort of you know it by being all of it. Like yeah. it counts, like it, but you don't have you don't have to reproduce it, therefore, in a certain way. So you don't have to know it. Yes, in the conventional you, sense. Anybody else has experience of it, actually. And then you, that's why you can interact well as a teacher. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, that talks about what uh, um, some talk scholars write about as a kind of a, an entirely different way of knowing. You know, sometimes I've heard the term tantric knowing, tantric epistemology, where, where you actually become the object of inquiry, yes. right? That's the non dual form of knowing. Yes, yes. Right which is not like dualistic knowing. Exactly. So we're going to be exploring that in the program together, yes, yes. connected to yogic direct valid cognition, the highest yes. form of knowing, where, yes. where the knowing is actually one of being, you become. Right, right, right. And I think that's a, a, also an embodied thing. And, and working with the body as well, um, to me, also empowers the immediate setup, immediacy of it, that it really is it's already here, it's within, it's right now, it's just a matter of, of recognition, right? It's, it's like it says in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which you translated so beautifully over and over, one of the most often repeated phrases, recognition and liberation are simultaneous. <laughs> uh, I, th I think that's one of the great take-homes. And that's one of the great take-homes. Well, yeah, I'm playing with that in, in, lately. I've been playing with that in relation to the Dignagian differentiation between inference and direct experience. Mm. Inference is a lower form, but necessary to unravel the conceptual knots that we have blocked our intuition or direct experience with. And um, so it's a definite duality with the direct experience trumping, <laughs> overcoming the inference, you know, the, the inference having greater fallibility, but they're still yeah. being conventionally valid inference. Absolutely. But my idea that what I've been playing with is the idea that knowledge of clear light, experience of that Buddhahood, non-duality is a merger also of inference and direct experience. Beautiful. Spot on. Somehow. Spot I on. I think Dignaga is, is working on that when he has the concept of yogi pratyaksha. Mm. He has the context of, um, it's almost like a seventh sense, you know, because they're operating with the Buddhist five sense thing. Right. 
by physical senses and the mental sense, which Six aligns yeah. Six one sense. or the other of them. Yep. Then there's a then the the instrument of yogi pratyaksha is shamatha vipassana unified. Oh, beautiful! So it's like a seventh sense almost. Yeah, that's beautiful. Over, when they deal with dinaga, they because they're talking about arguments with logicians and things like that, so they never push the dinaga sort of enlightenment nudge there. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, these are these are practices. What we're also going to be working with on a daily basis because this is the core, right? Shamatha, the quiescence, the stability, the pashna, the insight. Uh, um, this is a the yes. the unification of those um, a, a big part of what we're going to be doing in our week together because it's really that that conjunction of shamatha with the pashna, the insight born from that in this case also connected to this interiority thing that we're just talking about insight yes. becomes almost quite literal here and then it becomes much more than just even a cognitive insight it's a yes. um, affective somatic insight it's a type of insight that's Absolutely. full spectrum. If I only knew how to do, uh, I'm going to get, I'm going to see maybe if GPT can do it for me. <laughs> I always wanted to make a video, little clip where you take the thinker, you know, yeah. the, Rodin, the philosopher, you know, who's yeah. just like this. Rodin, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Morph him into sitting cross legged in a perfect meditation position. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. As the time when he <laughs> starts to unify with Shamatha and Vipassana, because because he realizes he has to sustain his thinking and he can't in that posture because his back is going <laughs> to give out and he's going to feel <laughs> he's going to feel constipated and really uncomfortable so he moves into a comfortable <laughs> position that would be the my dream for the west to show that as a as a logo or something for some philosophical study where the you know the thing there's a great thing in Dalama's recent book uh, that he had people compile, you know, these four books from yeah. Buddhist sources, Buddhist Shastra sources, you know, uh, for science, sort of Buddhist science kind of Right, thing. exactly. He, he really got the jump on me there. He really did. He really accomplished it. By the way, in the fourth one, what I really like, which I didn't read before in his intro, he says, well, you know, science needs philosophy because it's philosophy that aims science yeah. in the right direction. Yeah, you know, it's like meta. It's meta science, you know. Yeah, yep. and they think they killed off metaphysics because they think that the materialist is the final ph philosophical decision. But it isn't a philosophical decision. It's just a dogma. Yeah, right? it's, it's a bracketing of science of philosophy. And I can't tell you how many philosophers in my academic side, or not a huge number, but a few, who found philosophy reborn for them. By discovering Buddhist philosophy. Oh, that's fantastic. Modern personal philosophy says philosophy is dead. It's not the mirror of nature. It can't discuss. There's no more metaphysics, in other words. Right. So they handed that over to the materialists. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. I think that he really nicely described how philosophy is needed as part of a science education, not just oh my gosh. Uh, putting it in a pipette, you know, in a <laughs> biology lab, and then you become a biologist. You have to know what, how the rules of your thinking and your and how you interpret your experiences have to be validated in some way and and refined and and bring you to deeper experiences. You know. Well, I mean, as you mentioned uh, Chat GPT a couple of times. I mean, boy, does this does this uh, little riff apply to the directionality that's so imperative now with all the issues around AI. Yes, I mean, that's enough. That's a colossal issue right now. I know. I so, know. Although I love AI myself. What I don't like is AS, which is artificial stupidity, yeah. which is what we've been dealing with, right? With all these internet crazies who are like, want to, right. like, they don't want to pay taxes and they live on loans and they want to vote for right. and They don't care what just so they don't have to pay taxes. Well, of course, they would have a billion dollar bill. You know, with a hundred billion, you'd have like a five billion dollar bill. <laughs> Being well, let, Bob, let's take let's take this just a step further and tie it back into our stuff. I mean, AS is is also artificial samsara, right? So when we're talking about nature of mind, we're talking about something natural. What we're talking about here, what you're implying here, is something we're going to be emphasizing in, in the program, is that that this, the non duality, the nature of mind, is in fact the nature of things, I and know. therefore um, it's it's immediate. And and the question I want to ask you is. Like I mentioned a little bit at the outset, is accessibility. Um, if it is in fact the natural state, 
um, how did the the artificial stupidity? How, how why don't we see it more regularly? Exactly. Well, because I think we're too scared. We're too mm. terrified by cultures. Mm. They 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 they've been for thousands of years now. We've been in a militarized planet. You know, even the even um, ancient sutra from India uh, calls Shakyamuni's era among the thousand Buddhas as the era of most militarization, shortest human lifespan, most turbulence in societies because of that. And because of that, we have been in cultures where they frightened the individuals to, that this, they, they, that the reality is very dangerous and there's enemies about to chew you up from mm. every direction. And you need a high priest for magic, and you need a king for violence, and uh, then you just have to be afraid of everything, and then they'll, but you have to depend on them. So, in other words, people are afraid to sort of be open in life, and uh, that's another thing. I'm, I'd love your thoughts on it. Why don't we translate emptiness as openness? I, it's my, that is my favorite translation, Bob. Exactly. That, the, that is one I use all the time. That's my favorite yes. translation. Absolutely. I think it is really the best. I think Absolutely. we actually talk about starting a, a meme. <laughs> yes. Way. Because no, it, could... you know, in one way, then you lose a little bit the scariness of emptiness. Which... Totally. Totally. But on the other hand, emptiness is not scary. It's the non-emptiness that's scary. That's Absolutely. Like the fanatic, yeah. you know? so, so emptiness is just the openness of mind and openness of things. So we're closed yep. because we're taught that that's a safe way to be. We're scared. Yep. To I think that's the reason why more of us don't know. But you know what's great now? For example, I just had a new insight that I didn't think of before, which I've got to tell. Yuval Harari, who I really oh, I love the guy. I like him a lot. He's upset about AI. He's really, really upset about it. Oh, yeah. The well, point is this. Nobody in in uh, Silicon Hood Valley or whatever it is, Holly Silicon Wood, whatever it's called, nobody there is teaching the AI to read old Sanskrit. Mm. not teaching it to read old Tibetan, the Tendur and Kandur. Yeah. It's Tibetan, so it can read it itself. It's supposed to be reading large language models. How come it's not reading all Buddhist Chinese, Buddhist Japanese, Buddhist Korean, Buddhist Tibetan, Buddhist? Why is it not reading all of that culture? Yeah. That culture has built in into the languages lots of more selfless and compassion oriented and empathetic things, you know, like the famous Japanese thing where they got kicked out of international crew racing. You know that story in the third? Uh, yeah, yeah. Remember that one? Oh, I, I, no, I don't know the story. I mean, I know that, that type of racing. So what's the story? The international crew racing, like eight-man crews, they got kicked out because they nearly beat a Dutch team or something in England somewhere in the 30s and at some Olympic or something. And then two of them died. Oh, jeez. Because they they had burst blood vessels, you know, because they went beyond their body's uh, capacity ability and capability by being in part of the... Meant by, uh, Mob mentality, group. yeah. But just on the Japanese competitive culture, for that matter. But the group, the group, the language leading into the feeling of being one with the group and giving yourself completely to the group beyond your physical capacity, seemed to be a Japanese cultural thing. So then they didn't want, they didn't want wow. their crews coming in dead. <laughs> yeah, that's bad for business. Well, I want to return, but you know, this this translation of emptiness is is openness, and, and during the course of our time together, Amanda, we're going to talk about. <laughs> We're going to talk about the relationship of emptiness to, to non-duality, to enlightenment, like how does all that stuff fit together? Okay. But I really like, for another reason I really love the definition of a translation of emptiness as openness is it, it relates to my very favorite definition of meditation altogether, which is habituation to openness. Yes, of course. It becomes really a double entendre because now it's a habituation to openness in a more colloquial sense. Yes. A deeper level is habituation to emptiness, to the nature of reality. And so we yeah. get to work with with all those kind of bandwidths. Um, I know, because in, when you say emptiness, you have to immediately reassure people. It means that everything, every relative thing is empty of an absolute core. Yeah. It would give it, make it problematic for it to relate. So actually, it's all, all still here. And uh, and I had a real hit on that teaching in Italy recently. Where I, oh, at Mandalay. Yes, you know, Mandalay. Yep. You know? Yep. No, I know you're no nose. No, this, I think I told you this. No, I know you're no nose, et cetera, go like that. So you could be looking at your own face in the mirror and you could point and you could say, no eye, no ear, no nose, because that's not my eye, my ear, my nose, my tongue, because it's just a reflection in a mirror. Yeah, nice. It's not, my, it's not my eye, my ear, yeah. no nose. 
So in other words, it's it's just pure relation, you know. And do you know a philosopher named Benjamin Britten? Oh, of course. Yeah. Do you, know, you know his work? I don't know his work. Well, there's also a composer by that name as well, oh, right? No. Well, right. I, don't I know you're not talking about the composer. I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. Maybe it is the same guy. I don't know. But uh, the, I read it in the in the, uh, the magazine of the of the Berggruen Foundation called um, uh, what's it called? Called something. Uh, that I read a little description from uh, Benjamin Bratton's theory about something, and it was this theory about how everything the self is this completely interrelational process intertwined with everything and it doesn't need to have like one core thing that that strings it together it's like more like a weave you know and it was a complete and he quoted carlo rovelli which i was uh, about. relational interpretation exactly the so somehow the idea that that the, the great buddhist philosophers scientists are helping the quantum physicists and some new Greed a philosopher to get back into the reality business. Yeah, really try to articulate the very difficult thing to articulate in the English language, where you have you know subject, you know and predicate, you know verb, action, to, 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 to the uh, yeah. to the you know the the, the, the accusatives they are accusing the accusatives, right. <laughs> a pronoun for example, working through the verb and accusing the accusatives. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's like uh, they have to train AI in the, all these other languages if they want to have a real large language model. Why does That's, English is supposed to understand the universe? Yeah, exactly. Uh, only a language like English. I think that's spot on. That's spot on. Well, Bob, I think this is great. This is, I think it, it gives folks a sense that what we're going to be doing at MEMA is, this is great. It's exactly like what we're doing here. Bob and I engage in a lot of dialogue. I take the mornings. He takes the afternoons. And what we do is we work with a, a cross-pollination and, and a juxtaposition of ancient and, and modern, East and West, bringing in the, you know, pretty standard hardcore power of the tradition, homage to the tradition, to the text, to the practices. Yeah. But then, but then tr translated, applied to artificial intelligence, to politics, to the climate, to philosophy. So it's not just what we do with our text. It's not just what we do on the cushion. It's what we do in the in our lives, so we can get out of a retreat like this, and engage with newfound insights, with all the stuff that's happening in this day and age, and maybe see it from a new lens and a new perspective. And so, Bob, I personally can't wait. This might highlight, highlight of the year for me to spend a week with you at Menla. I love it up there. All and right. so for all those of you who are interested, um, we would love to have you with us. I think it's going to be. We would. A we would. Please join us, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Right, thanks, Bob. Great. Always such a delight. Take yeah, care. So great. Back to back to the tennis. Right back to Wimbledon. Okay. <laughs> Take it easy. Great talking. Bye bye now. Okay. Bye.